Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Hit down 911, what's the location of the emergency? They hope to go. I think there's somebody shooting in here. Okay, what well, makes you think that? Because somebody said, I thought I thought a glimpse of somebody, they're running down the hallway. Okay, well, they're still running, they're still shooting. Sandy, go to school, please. Are you safe right now? Uh, I think so. My prayer from door is not locked. Okay, is there anybody that can lock the classroom door without you being safe? No, okay, no. They can do so. Okay. All right, just try to stay where you are. Okay, I have anyway, to be at some There's children in the trunk. Okay, try to apply pressure, okay? Okay, we have people coming, okay? Uh huh. All right. I'm dead down the corridor. All right, I want you to take cover. Jen, get the sergeant. Get everybody you can going down there. All right, let me, start. Let me get some information from you. What makes you think that? The fun glass is all shot out of there. It kept, kept going on. Okay. It's still happening. I keep hearing shooting. I keep okay. hearing popping. popping. Gunfire aimed at elementary school children. The details are still pouring in. There are 27 victims, 20 children, seven adults. And we've heard all day about the incredible response by teachers inside the school, which is considered one of the leading schools in the nation. It is an almost unimaginable scene. What we know so far is that inside this elementary school was a group of young kids, and there was one deranged man who decided to take it all away. Among the dead, 20-year-old gunman Adam Lanza and his mother, who was a teacher's aide at the elementary school, he came with a bulletproof vest and four guns, including two semi-automatic handguns and possibly an assault rifle, say authorities. He killed so many of the kids she loved. It's a very, very difficult scene for the family members, for all the responding first responders. It's a tragedy. It's a tragic scene. Welcome back to another I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again with a very, very sad case. And I'm joined by, once again, of course, he's still here. It's the Dalmatian Daddy. Thanks. It's Benjamin Carter. Good to be back, yeah. Just for the audio listener, he is wearing a t-shirt that says Dalmatian Daddy. It's not a pet name for him. Could You have got a few pet names for me. Smeggy is the one on the phone. Yeah, we, know, we talked about changing that, though, didn't we? I didn't say anything about changing it. Yeah. Did we? Did we not? No. Smeggy with a money bag, I guess. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah you, when you won a bet once and then you lost it, and then I just kept it this morning. Kept most of it. So. <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Enough yeah. of that. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, good, good. For those that are listening to episodes chronologically or viewing them, I want to apologise. I haven't seen the edit yet, but I have a feeling I'm going to sound a little bit rough and nasally last week. So apologies for those people. I did nearly die. How are you doing, Dan? <laughs> Very much alive, actually. Um, good. Feeling nice. great. Welcome back to Boston Sound. You notice how um, Ben wasn't coughing at all until we started recording? just took a swift inhale before my coffee and it set me off it really set me on a raz what this new mug <laughs> yes guys um for those who don't know i didn't see your announcement um we have a new home fig map icmap.co.uk uh well there's some new merchandise we've been say, talking about it long enough haven't we ben we have indeed and not only is there new merchandise but it's uh it's our whole <laughs> it has a whole host of things really i'm i'm lost for words yeah i'm uh, blown away by the platform sure it's, it's like the new home of it map we've moved away from patreon we're now going to be having content over there so you can become a member over there and join the cult you'll also gain access to exclusive merch and it's actually cheaper than patreon all boxes are ticked yes. everybody wins we're all winners tonight so we're all winners tonight yeah as well as that we're doing some discord bits we're doing um q a's birthday messages and uh, the merch is spectacular we're never going to run out of sizes there's hats there's beanies there's sweatshirts there's hoodies, there's t-shirts, and there's new mugs. Yeah. A scully mug, a swampy mug. Beautiful. And the good thing about the swampy mug is if you leave it out with a bit of coffee in there for a while, it kind of fits the vibe of it. Yeah, it, it does you a bit, yeah. I mean? Yeah, if the milk goes you know off. I mean? yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But um, <laughs> why not head over and um, and let us know what you think because we're very happy with it. Producer Dan has worked very hard in it, so I want to thank Producer Dan for that. Big time. But as well, he, we have moved all the Minnesotes over from Patreon, so they're all sitting over there. So you're not going to miss miss out on anything. And yeah, we're very proud of it and happy with it, and we hope you guys like it too. And where can they find it, Tom? www icmap.co.uk and for those with Keen it currently things are in dollars but we will eventually have that change but it's, it's don't worry about it why is it such a big deal it's just dollars isn't it it's and, just a conversion and yeah as Tom mentioned everything's over there all of our exclusive content we've got a hundred episodes sat there waiting for you as well as some very there'll be a roundabout we've got other shit if including yeah, the other bit small so there'll be a hundred episodes sat over there for you and we're adding new ones every single week as well as that very fresh and clean new merch and uh, get yourself a swampy mug we're not having a competition yet i don't think i stand a chance because that is a very cool see, scully mug see what he's doing already yeah see what he's doing oh, everyone, oh, the everyone wants to pick the pick a swampy mug it's fine have that maybe put your pens in it your pencils yeah, uh, yeah. well dan you could use that one to just get the crap out of your pond <laughs> it all works no if you buy a swampy mug good luck to you in a nice way yeah but enough of our plug-in we've got a case to cover today and it's it's a controversial one. There's uh, controversy attached. There's conspiracy attached. And I've had a bit of a soul searching period before heading over here tonight. When we sit down before we pick a series, we have our list of sort of 10, 11 episodes. And I always throw in wanting to cover either a mass shooting event or a school shooting because I find them so fascinating, but also so harrowing at the same time to research this one. It's very, very bleak. They're all very, very bleak, of course, but it is always quite difficult because with some of the more kind of, if we go back hundreds of years and cover old old school serial killers, we can have a bit of a, can make, we can take it lightly. I think it's because you, you can divorce yourself from it because it feels so long ago. And even some of the language you use and some of the references within it is so old worldy. It doesn't feel like it's real kind of, you can divorce yourself from it a bit. Yeah. Whereas this, obviously it's so fresh. Some of the accounts as well it's just yeah it's it's absolutely harrowing so today we are covering the sandy hook elementary school shootings so a little bit of a warning obviously we're going to be discussing today um children being killed um which you know, there's no other way of saying it really so completely understand if some people want to maybe give this episode a miss there might be slightly a bit less levity in this one but yeah we're going to cover it and because we think it's important for these things to be covered Definitely. You mentioned, obviously, with the older cases, we can put that distance between us. It doesn't seem quite the same world. I saw an image on Twitter the other day that seemed completely alien to me in the January statistics for mass shootings in oh, America. Yeah. And I just chucked it into our WhatsApp group. And it just, we were, what, 25, 26 days into a new year and there'd been double that number of mass shootings in America. It's just, and it was basically an, an image of America and it wasn't just a, a centralised location. It's the whole country and the whole country's covered in, yeah. in instances where something like this has happened and it's just it's unfathomable that these things continue to happen and yeah i feel i just feel like every time we sit down and we research one of these we're left feeling just completely hollow afterwards which uh is very much the case in uh, in the, in terms of this week's episode so it's fascinating because of the psychology behind it the motivations behind it but ultimately the the senselessness behind it is just bewildering so yeah it's an interesting one but it's a very upsetting one at the same time the debate will forever go on about the guns and, and american and as three people from england you know it's, it's something that i think it, we find it very hard to understand how it's it is the way it is but it's, i think it's a different conversation maybe we'll discuss it a little bit more at the end of the episode but yeah we're going to cover this case um as we said complete understand if maybe it's one that you want to duck out of complete respect that but um yes we are going to go through the case now. So this week's episode is the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, also referred to as the case of Adam Lanza, the Sandy Hook tragedy, the Newtown massacre, and it's uh, commonly referred to as America's most controversial mass shooting. And yeah, we, we've covered a lot of different spree killers, mass shootings in our time from all across the world. And yeah, this one, I was at the end of it, just felt very numb, felt yeah. very, very numb. So we're going to go into the childhood of Adam Lanza and he's the uh, man who committed this heinous act and we're going to see how and why he um, ended up doing what he ended up doing. So Adam Peter Lanza was born on the 22nd of April 1992 in Exeter, New Hampshire, USA. He was the second son of Peter and Nancy Lanza. Adam had a brother called Ryan who was four years older than him. The Lanza family were of Italian descent with Adam's great-grandparents originating from Sicily. Yeah, I, I just got excited when I saw that. I thought, uh, oh, what could Lanza mean? And it's just short for Lancia. But in Spanish... Lanza is a nickname for soldier. What's short for Lancia? Well, what's, what's Lancia? Just a tiny bit longer. One one letter longer. So, I mean... Yeah. 
I don't know if it's necessarily short, but it's, uh, you know, sort of a, an Americanized version of Lancia. Let me just go. In Spanish, though, yeah, Lanza, nickname for soldier. Yeah. Was that your interest? No, mate, no. Well, I mean, we can. We can. Lancia's a car. I didn't realise that. Yeah, Lancia. Or Lancia. Well, I asked what it was, and neither of you said anything. <laughs> I wasn't listening. <laughs> Please sit down, ladies and gentlemen. I was listening. Fuck off. <laughs> Mimicking me. <laughs> The Lanza family were very wealthy and very loving, which is an interesting dynamic in what will go on to happen. It's a really different family dynamic to other spree shooters that we've covered. Peter and Nancy were high school sweethearts and had moved into a house that was built by Peter's grandparents. And despite being born into good fortune, Adam would not speak his first word until he turned three years old. Until that point, he would just murmur, with some relatives believing he was mute or potentially making up his own language. As well as this, even as a baby, Adam would show visible signs of not wanting to be touched or held. And sometimes, if left alone, he could be found banging his head against floors and the walls. Making up his own language is a weird one to assume that he was doing. I think, yeah, you're just trying to reason with the fact that maybe the development is a bit behind yeah, or but, murmuring a lot. Yeah, you know, but then you don't go, oh, he's probably, he's probably he's trying to make up his own fucking language, so give him a break. Yeah. Well, there could be the other person going, oh, he's a, he's a mute, which is bad as well. Bad? Well, no, bad, just, just to be as judgmental as that on a three-year-old. Okay. If yeah. that, hypothetically did happen. From a very early age, there were clear signs that Adam could potentially have a developmental disorder as he appeared to have trouble communicating, frequently engaged in repetitive behaviours and did not display the level of social skills expected by the ages of three and four. He found it extremely hard to make and maintain eye contact and would often become excessively emotional. Interestingly, it has been alleged that Adam fired his first gun when he was four years old. He would later go on to join the scouts where he would begin to shoot paper targets shaped as crows. Yeah, there's one particular photo that came out not long after the massacre of what appeared to be a baby holding a, a full-sized rifle and chewing on the butt of the rifle in like army gear mm. and it was v circulated across uh, across the media and, and the internet with people claiming that it's Adam Lanza and still to this day it can't be proven or disproven of, as to whether or not that is him or not but many many people have, have been able to evidence that it is him very eerie Adam's mother, Nancy, who for most of her life had been a stockbroker and a homemaker, was very fond of her two boys. And though the boy's father, Peter, was often away from the family home with work, she rarely had too many problems with Adam and Ryan. Nancy would regularly remove labels from Adam's clothing as he developed hypersensitivity. So basically anything on his skin that felt unnatural or uncomfortable to him would begin to trigger certain behaviours within him. So she had to remove all labels and tags from his clothing. It's speculated on both sides as to whether he was actually having legitimate behaviours as a result of that or that he was also throwing quite a lot of tantrums mm. because as we'll go on to talk about, his parents didn't perhaps manage this behaviour in the best possible way and they were very encouraging of it but he would develop a severe case of hypersensitivity. Adam would later go on to be diagnosed with sensory integration disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder as well as Asperger's syndrome and his parents were also advised by doctors to watch for seizures. Adam's father Peter worked as an executive and would often spend a lot of hours away from the family home. Peter had a well-paying role and provided for his family. When Peter was home he would regularly take his boys on camping and hiking trips in order to introduce them to wildlife and the great outdoors. There are lots of pictures of the Lanza family on such trips. Despite this, the boys seemed to favour their mother as they felt they could get away with more and that she was ever present in the family home. Although Adam was extremely fond of his father as the pair would regularly spend hours building Lego models in the basement, as a child, Peter says, Adam was always thinking different but he was just a normal little weird kid. Normal little weird. Normal little weird kid. Hmm. Mm. Ever play with Lego? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That was never my thing. No? No. What was your thing? Uh, Playmobil. Oh, so that's the slightly less cool for it. No, it's just it, chunky. Pirate added Playmobil. Pirate, Playmobil. Playmobil. I feel like Lego. Pirate ship. Pardon? I had a Playmobil pirate ship. Are oh. you going to say you feel like I wouldn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't have got Lego? I feel like that's where you were going. <laughs> well, kind of, because Ju Ju <laughs> Duplo is... Not Duplo. What did you say? I don't know what I said. You said Duplo. I don't think I said Duplo, did I? Dan? Who said Playmobil? Playmobil. Oh, yeah. But then Playmobil before, before that. Playmobil's like model kits, man. No. Yeah. You said before Lego, you said Duplo. I never said Duplo. I don't think you did, no. Okay. It's a singer. It's not even a singer, it's a DJ. Adam began to develop some compulsions that would form part of his everyday routine throughout his childhood. He would frequently wash his hands after entering and exiting different rooms of the house, to the point in some cases that his hands would actually start bleeding. Did he have sinks in every room? I think he had like little stations. Oh, little stations. Little hand sanitisation. Oh, the Playmobil, yeah. Yeah. 
But yeah, often to the point that his hands would bleed. And he would also change his socks so often to the point that his mother, Nancy, she'd have to do free laundry loads of socks per day. Per day does not sound. It's what I've heard. It's what you heard. It's what I've researched, yeah. Three laundry loads of socks per day. It's probably about 50 socks, isn't it? How Thank is God it? I didn't say an odd number. I'm thinking, yeah, there's no way he's, he's changing his socks that many times. So they're a very wealthy family. They they didn't want for they nothing. Could, they had they socks had... coming out of their ears, Ben. Yeah, exactly, right? And sinks in every corridor. But yeah, apparently free laundry loads of socks per day. Now, if that means like I'm doing the normal laundry plus some, some extra Adam's socks, I don't know. But yeah, free laundry loads of socks. Mm. Yeah. I would just tell him I've washed them <laughs> when I hadn't. Yeah. I think he'd pick up on it. Would he? Yeah, he picked up on lots of things. And other things that he picked up on were certain smells that nobody in the house could smell. So Adam also complained of smelling certain smells in the house that nobody else could smell. Just repeated myself. Why did you repeat yourself? Because I was trying to sort of take myself into the next sentence nicely. Oh, sorry. And I took myself into the same sentence I was trying to take myself into. <laughs> you reversed into a ditch. Yeah, in a way. You know. Adam would also get through an entire box of tissues per day. You can relate to that, can you? I can, yeah, runny nose. But Adam actually didn't use them for a runny nose, or what you're suggesting I may use them for. He used them in glove form in order to touch doorknobs or window screens. And while some parents may have tried to manage or contain these compulsions, Nancy was very much giving in to Adam's every obsession, and also some have argued that she was encouraging them, to the point where she almost enabled him and continued to sort of push him down. You know, have as many as you want. Adam, are you sure you want to wear their socks longer? I could put them in the wash. Oh. I haven't got ACD, so I don't know if you if you review to do or slightly do or whatever. Me but, and Dan definitely do. I'm answering for him. But not to this level, though. Yours is just like you don't like things being slightly out of line. Does that stuff not bother you? Oh, not drastically, no, but I'm saying oh. to the point which he's saying he's worrying about germs, he's being hypersensitive to that. You can't just say, oh, don't be silly and we can just move on. No, no, but what she's saying is, oh, Adam, yeah, have your tissues, have your socks, have your... But then if, if not, if it's going to lead to him... But you can also kind of try and negate and manage, you know, okay, you don't really need 17 pairs of socks today, let's try 12. Yeah, do you know she didn't try that? She may well have done, but what my point was is that a lot of people have said she was very much giving in to him, almost enabling him. Yeah, there's obviously there's, there's certain treatments you can try, which maybe if they hadn't tried that, then perhaps, but I think it's, it's, it's not as easy. Yeah, get him a pair of slippers. Wash them though, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, not as often. Slipper mm -hmm. socks. Yeah, yeah. As a youngster, Adam didn't have very many friends with the exception of his mother and brother and would much prefer to shut himself away in his own room than play outside with others. When he attended school, this presented many challenges to an already very anxious and socially apprehensive young boy. His anxiety was heightened when he went from Patreon over to a new website. That's a nice sentence. His anxiety was heightened at school when he was surrounded by loud and busy environments, as well as having to change rooms and settings on a regular basis. This made studying and socialising extremely difficult for him, and he would retreat into his bedroom as soon as he arrived home as a result. In 1998, not long after Adam had turned six, his father Peter was offered his dream job, and after much debate, the family made the decision to move from Exeter to Newtown, Connecticut. Basically, they were living in their dream home, they'd They've got property, they've had big plans to do other things in, in um, Exeter. But uh, yeah, this was Peter's dream job and, and they decided to go for it. But it did cause a bit of tension in the household. So as well as the relocation, Adam obviously had to also enrol in a new school. Adam found both the relocation as well as his new school environment incredibly difficult to adjust to. This led to Adam feeling extreme anxiety to the point that he would begin to experience panic attacks. And again, his family have sometimes referred to his panic attacks as tantrums, but teachers and fellow pupils have also referred to them as, as genuine panic attacks. This anxiety also caused him to become depressed and further isolate himself from society. On one particular occasion, Adam's anxiety became so bad that he was required to be taken to hospital. He was rushed to the emergency room of Danbury Hospital, where he would later be discharged. It's kind of like the brother in Better Call Saul. With the lights yeah. and the noises. Yeah, so the, the sensory integration disorder is a neurological disorder that results from the brain's inability to integrate certain information received from the body's sensory system. So it can be all sorts of different things that trigger you in a, in a negative way. For him, it was certain sounds and certain lights that would make him incredibly anxious and incredibly uncomfortable. And smells. And certain smells, yeah, that some existed, some didn't. And noises. He wouldn't like let his mum wear high heels in the house. Yeah. 
yeah. and the doorbell was a no-go. The mum wouldn't let the doorbell be rung because it would cause him to have a tantrum. Mm. Nancy and Peter's marriage became strained over the years. Nancy would look after the boys during the week whilst Peter worked away, and they would switch roles at the weekend. Peter moved to Stamford, and the family stayed in Newtown. Peter said, I'd work ridiculous hours during the week, and Nancy would take care of the kids. Then on weekends, she'd do errands, and I'd spend time with the kids. Doing errands, not like Nancy really gets much her time no in 2001 the couple divorced adam was nine at the time and this had a significant impact on him though he was later questioned about his parents separation by psychiatrists adam said that they were as irritating to each other as they were to him yeah it's quite a, a remark to make about your parents he was near only nine it's quite sassy yeah for, for, for nine it's quite a bitchy thing to say as a nine-year-old isn't it yeah so despite the divorce both parents regularly saw and spent time with the boys Peter said that in the years that followed, Adam became keenly interested in politics and economic theory, which again, he's sort of 11, 12 at this point, and that's, that's quite an interest to take at that age. I was watching Space Jam and stuff like that at that age. Stuff like that. Oh, what other basketball movies with, with the Looney Tunes? And Sonic played a game in an episode of Sonic, I think. Pardon? Sonic and Knuckles had like a bit of a basketball game. Did they? Yeah, there was a nice Sonic the Hedgehog lady version. When I was very young, it's like, oh, and I was a bit, what's going on here? Ooh, what yeah. a little feeling. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Popped it in a gold ring. <laughs> <laughs> what? As well as this, Adam also became obsessed with World War II and would regularly read books and watch documentaries on the subject. He initially also showed an interest in wanting to join the military as an army ranger. So through this time as well, we'll, we'll talk about the mother's fascination with weaponry, but he'd yeah. also been going to the scouts and... Obviously, there's, there's suggestions that he was very involved with weaponry from a very early age. He also wanted to go on to study at Cornell University. Peter and Adam recall going on a trip to see Bill Cosby live, which apparently resulted in Adam laughing for hours straight. This was one of the rare occasions that Peter claims his son was genuinely happy. Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby live. Why was he so happy? Maybe he just thought that the jokes were good. Yeah. Many have speculated that Adam was bullied relentlessly at school and that his parents were oblivious to this. It's like an Alton Towers sentence, that one, isn't it? Relentless and oblivion, aren't they too right? B oblivion is? What's relentless? Oh, it's an energy drink. drink. Yeah. Sorry. Fuck. Accident. Nemesis was the other one. His mother once... Bullied by a nemesis at the school, probably. His mother once reported that Adam... That's like a Blink-182 album, that, isn't it? Adam's song. His mother once reported that Adam arrived home from school covered in bruises, but immediately retreated to his room before saying anything. Though he may have seemed to his parents as an easy target to fall victim of bullying, no fellow students or pupils have said that he was bullied. Though his behaviours were explored further as a child, Adam was placed into mainstream schools, and many different schools struggled to manage his emotions and support his education at the same time. This resulted in Adam attending several different schools from elementary through to middle school, and even uh, his mother Nancy would try and make special arrangements with the school to help support him and make him feel safe and comfortable and, and talk about his sensory integration disorder his ocd and his aspergers all of the different um schools really struggled to find the resource to give all that attention just to one particular student so none of the schools seemed to provide a suitable match for adam and as a result adam was moved to st rose of lima school in 2005 but he would only stay there for eight weeks before moving on to newtown high school that's like you that's like a you on plenty of fish paragraph that is a bit yeah eight weeks <clears throat> super man i find a super match <laughs> I've never, never, never been on there. No? No. Have you ever looked, Ben? Fish. The names always put me off. Plenty more bush in the forest. Is that better? Plenty more bush. Yeah, in the forest. That's just the band Bush playing over and over again. Swallowed! <laughs> the only song I know about that. Oh. Good song. Yeah. Oh, that no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do that. So it's not clear as to whether he was removed or requested to leave St. Rose of Lima School, but um, regardless, he's found himself now at Newtown High School, where he was described by teachers as intelligent, but nervous and fidgety. He struggled to fit in at school and was also described as not being able to hold eye contact with anybody, whilst also being shy, nervous, socially awkward and unable to keep still and stop his body from moving. In some of the accounts I heard, it, he really struggled just getting from one classroom to another. When it was busy in the hallway, he'd really struggle just with all the noises, all the things going on. He would absolutely hate that. And some classrooms, he would just spend his time sat in a dark room kind of yeah. thing. So yeah. it, it was, you can understand if someone ha is suffering with those ailments. Definitely. Obviously, to, obviously to, and kids could be cruel. Like to them, it would be, you know, someone's carrying in the corner in the hallway when you're just walking from class to class. Yeah. And, and it would have been hard for everyone everyone involved. Because the mother also, in one particular instance, it was it was at Newtown, she'd arranged for him to have slightly earlier private lessons that mm. would allow him to get down the corridors yeah. in good time before they began to be too populated. But 
yeah, it's it's hard. I do think of the the brother from Better Call Saul now that you've said that because that the way that <laughs> yeah. those sequences are shot, it tries to make you experience it from his perspective, and it's really like jarring. Yeah, the, so, just yeah. the noises and yeah, the lights and things like that. Yeah. So when Adam was in fifth grade, he and another boy took part in a creative writing class in which they wrote the story, The Big Book of Granny. So Dan, when you hear that, you probably think it's quite a nice, pleasant story, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not. In which an older lady with a walking cane conceals within it a rifle and begins to kill people in the streets, seemingly at random. She also tries to taxidermy one of her victims and cannibalise one of the other ones. Later into the book, she says, I like hurting people, especially children. I was quite afraid of old people when I was little. Yeah, yeah. I found them spooky. Well, I I got in a similar sort of bind to Lanza here with my toilet rat story. But obviously mine wasn't as dark as this, just about... Another world. Well, you, you were doing poos and rats were eating your poo. Don't think it was that. Are you? Do you remember the toilet rat story, yeah. Dan? Um, I, it rings a bell. Like but series two or series yeah, three. Yeah, was, wasn't the rat wanting more no, food? No one was pooing. Oh, but there was a world underneath the toilet uh, sewer. There was a sewer where the rat lived, but it would pull people down through the toilet because he wanted demanded more. Yeah, it was a bad rat. Yeah. And I got pulled up on that. My parents had to come and see my teachers after school. Why? Because apparently it was a bit dark. I don't know what else I said the rat was up to. But <laughs> it, was it a regular sized rat or like one giant? Giant rat. Like giant rat. Human sized uh, rat pulling children. Human sized rat. Yeah. Spit like at me, du- bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine you wrote something like that. Oh, okay. No, I don't think it had dialect. Oh. There's a big world under the toilet. The, oh, really? Yeah, the setting. The setting. <laughs> Could have wrote m- multiple books. Daft Wasp when we were on holiday. That was oh, another yeah. one of my. My good comments. That wasn't yours. Yes, it was. I won't. Yeah, it was Darth Wasp. I think I wrote Darth Wasp. I drew it. Yeah. You're the Quinton Blake to the Roald Dahl. That's fine. But after he's hit by a <laughs> paralyzing <laughs> tropic disease. Adam tried to sell copies of his book on school grounds, but got in trouble as a result. One of his teachers would note that the boy had consistently violent and disturbing language and imagery in his writings, though this was never explored further. I think with that, it's like, because people are influenced by certain things, maybe your yeah. parents are watching horror films when you're younger and you've got yeah. Yeah, a bit of a dark interest. It's not to say, I'm sure Stephen King was writing horrible little stories when he was little. Yeah, yeah um, you don't want to discourage someone's art. Yeah, and also, R.L. Should- Stein. Yeah, exactly right. Say cheese and die. Yeah, a read a boy, you're in for a scare. Yeah, big worms. Wasn't it big worms? Need a poo, don't do that. <laughs> the toilet rat. <laughs> brilliant, it's brilliant. They yeah. would have sold. It's important to note, though, as well, he didn't, it wasn't just Adam that wrote the big book of Granny. There was another boy involved. So I him. It's a horrible phrase in the big book Def- of Granny. Yeah, I'm not sure what to expect. Just think of Danny Dyson and knock the Granny out of it. Makes me think of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. As well as this, Adam also wrote a paper entitled Why I Hate My School, Sandy Hook. And the first page of this basically just had a large drawing of a frowning, crying face. He then goes on to list his reasons for hating Sandy Hook, which are as follows. And they're quite insightful because some of these are, I can understand is his frustrations with parts of this, but it's it's an interesting insight. The list is as follows. People, unsanitary, not enough time, Overcrowded hallways. Teachers being disappointed in me. I always miss homework deadlines. Bus. Lunch is too short to be enjoyable. I learn too slowly. Waking up early for disappointment. I can't learn the way that school teaches. It's quite a list. Yeah, it is an interesting list. I mean, and you can imagine a, a child having Asperger's syndrome. Things about, you know, not understanding how they're being, how he's been taught, not understanding why things are like lunchtime so short, and things not kind of being... He's not got the support network around him. Yeah, you can see why that'd be frustrating. Definitely. And again, it's like with, with other things he's written, you wouldn't look at that paper and be like, this is, oh, why didn't they look at this further? Because it's, you know, it's just essentially a list, isn't it? So... Mm-hmm. Adam's anxiety went through the roof when he was in his early teens. He was required to convey feelings and emotion through performing in a school play. His mother Nancy would coach him through the role and attempt to explain the emotions to him, but he took them very literally. Nancy wrote to a friend, Adam is taking it very seriously, even practicing facial expressions in the mirror. As well as this, to support with Adam's sensory disorder, Nancy would also remove any colour images from books he was reading or photos and posters he had in his bedroom and have them photocopied into black and white to prevent any heightened sensitivity. So she does seem like she, although I made the point earlier that she was sort of encouraging his his um, obsessions, she's also being really supportive and trying to make things work hmm. for her son and trying to get that support and care that he needs, but... Yeah, it does. It does take a, a weird 
shift shortly. As we mentioned, Adam was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. This diagnosis was made when he was 13. When he was evaluated, it was concluded that Adam had no empathy and made literal interpretations of writing and speech. This, together with the heightened social anxieties he was facing, made his teenage years particularly challenging. In 2007, despite Adam going on to earn a place in the honour roll, his anxieties continued to grow and he began to attend school less and less. As a result of this, the Lanza family eventually made the decision to remove Adam from the education system and begin to homeschool him, with his mother Nancy offering to be his teacher. She would then begin to teach her son from home, and during this time Adam also began to struggle with eating and sleeping in any form of routine. So yeah, he developed a bit of an eating disorder as well, and he also did not engage engage in any counselling or seek any medical support either. That's one thing to note as well with um, his parents. When they divorced, his father would pay quite a handsome Big. sum of money to, to Nancy to help support him as well. So over $200,000 a year or something yeah, like that. which is... Yeah. So she didn't have to work anymore. Yeah, and he was happy to do it, apparently. Um, I mean, obviously, he, I'm sure he was aware that she was taking on quite a lot of responsibility there and a lot of stress. And as well, it's been reported, apparently, Nancy kept a lot of this to herself she didn't say to a lot of people she didn't want people to know she was struggling with the kind of her maybe indulging in some of these things it was just thought that you know like how if someone's got a child misbehaving might give them an ipad it's just make them happy and just Mm. for an easy life yeah it'd be easier if she just does these things for adam rather than you know trying to go against it yeah. So while spending more time with Adam, Nancy began to introduce him to her passion for weaponry. She had often taken her boys shooting during their childhood, but began to introduce Adam to different pistols and rifles, as well as how to maintain and operate them. Adam added guns to his growing list of obsessions and fully immersed himself into researching and understanding gun ownership, as well as practicing his marksmanship. At the same time, he became obsessed with gore sites, as well as forums in support of school shooters and mass shooters, including the Columbine as fan site. Adam would research school shooting intricately, to the point that he regularly began to make redactions and edit articles on Wikipedia relating to mass shootings, which is an odd correlation with um, Anders Breivik, who did a similar thing with yeah. Wikipedia. And, and Adam was a big fan of him as well, like really looked up to him. Yeah, so it's... it's uh, and again, like, like I mentioned at the start of this episode, and me and Ben have mentioned numerous times, we're, we're not gun guys. Um, but apparently, from what I gather, you know, having an interest in weapons in America, it's not particularly... You know, going to a gun, just going to a gun range and shooting them, it's just a hobby. It's nothing too wild. As it probably would have seen him over here if someone was doing it, it'd be slightly yeah. you know, a bit more different. It was she just found it's the time where, oh, he's enjoying this, I enjoy this, it's a hobby we can do together. There was no alarm. She wasn't worried about anything, yeah. worried about anything sinister happening in from it she obviously wasn't looking at what he was googling and, and what he was searching but yes it's some people like oh you know you hear that you know that's very why was she doing that but yeah if it's a hobby and it's a time when you're really connecting with your son can you hold that against her so much no and exactly and and it's keeping him out of trouble it's keeping his um sort of tantrums at bay you mentioned his obviously his his what he's doing online and his his internet footprint is i had no idea about some of the stuff he was mm. looking at which we'll, we'll go into but yeah he apparently he had like an encyclopedia type of knowledge of different mass shootings he could tell you what weapons they used what time and dates they arrived how many victims they claimed like he knew everything and he would even argue with people on these forums saying no actually he didn't use this he used this and because he, he when they eventually would go into the house they found a big old spreadsheet didn't they where he ranked basically ranked all the school shooters in terms of who was the best and who got the most kills and it also had James Holmes in there as a mass shooters as well mm-hmm. and yeah he was fascinated by the subject matter Adam also became obsessed with various video games including Call of Duty World of Warcraft and Grand Theft Auto it has also been proven that Adam downloaded video games that put you into the role of an active school shooter including Super Columbine Massacre RPG he would constantly have his bedroom window blinds closed to black out the room but this would eventually be replaced by taped up black bin bags across the window. But again, I suppose he could have argued that it was about his sensory integration disorder. So you can kind of understand that. He also began to frequently go to the local arcade at weekends and sometimes for between four to ten hours at a time in order to play Dance Dance Revolution and Just Dance. There are many videos online of Adam on the dance mat and he actually, he's pretty intense. He's pretty... Apparently he was very good at the game and he would do it with his hood up and it seemed like yeah, he, he was obsessed with trying to get the high score and beat himself on there as well. Definitely, yeah. And uh, there's there's multiple videos, some people filming him doing it, not knowing who he was, but then there's also a couple of videos that he filmed himself. And yeah, get a very sort of girl with the dragon tattoo vibes with like the hoodie and kind of hiding his face while dancing away. I haven't seen, does, does she dance? I just think she wears a hoodie. 
Okay. Hauntingly, uh, as well, when he is on uh, Dance Dance Revolution, he is completely focused. This is the thing that really stuck with me. Whenever he's focused on a certain task, he is on that task. Mm. And like he is performing almost machine-like moves. That is something that would reoccur in his future, which is quite, quite grim. Oh, but I did think Dance Dance Revolution is pretty interesting. Oh. Let's go! <laughs> ben Carter's interesting facts. Interesting facts. I don't, I don't know. Interesting facts. So just to, just to people are aware, a little bit peep behind the, the old curtain of the ICMAP. Ben said this is going to be the best one he's ever done. Don't think I said that. You did. You said, guys, yeah, I've really blown this one in the park. I know the other ones I've done this series have been a bit... Well, I don't stand by them. Oh. Yeah. Well, then, okay. Well, yeah. let's see how let's see how you're done, boy. All right. Well, welcome back. First thing I, I sort of pointed out is video games and dance machines. It's an interesting bit of technology, isn't it? Sure is, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. I hear the audience, <laughs> <laughs> and I hear the audience um, sort of screaming out internally. Could you tell us a bit more about Dance Dance Revolution? Oh wow! So you literally just read. Got okay. Yeah, well, it's it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting subject. It's a game where you dance on the different arrows to yeah. beat the song. Yeah, literally. The, the, and the, more, that in, the more in sync your arrows are to the song, is yeah. the more points you it's get. It's like a guitar hero with your feet. It's like a guitar <coughs> hero with the feet. Yeah, perfect. So what I is thought, first of all, now that I've got you, what I thought, first of all, is, um, well, what's the world record for the longest time anyone's ever spent on Dance Dance Revolution? Because I have to keep reading it, Dance Dance Revolution. Because he obviously spent between four and ten hours a time going at it on the Dance Dance Revolution machine. I think that's the technical term. But I thought, what's the world record? And it turns out that a guy from Minnesota, Alexander Skudlerek, actually holds the current title for the longest time spent on Dance Dance. I'm always forgetting. Just say so the one. game. On the game, Dance Dance Revolution. <laughs> Made him longer. <laughs> Fucking hell. And do you know how long he spent on that machine? 32 hours. No, half that. Oh. oh. Yeah, I was, yeah, wasn't that blown so away? Six hours 16 than, hours yeah. and 18 minutes consecutively on Dance Dance Revolution. So I thought, uh, that's not really going to blow them away. And I did warn you, oh. But then I thought, okay, well, that was not that was a little underwhelming. So then I thought, what's the record Still time? Still kept it in there. Still, yeah. So this, I'm, I'm leading, I'm leading. And then I thought, okay, well, that wasn't, I wasn't that blown away. Not even a full day spent dancing. Mm. Uh, but 16 hours at a go. I don't know what the pace is, but yeah, pretty, you know. So I wasn't that impressed. So then I thought, okay, well, what's the record time spent on any video game consecutively? All right. Yeah. Now I've got you. Now I've got you. So it turns out that that record is held by an Australian guy called Okan Kaya. And he played Call of Duty. Any guesses for how long or have you already seen it? 48 hours. Dan, any advances on that? Three or four days. He played Call of Duty for 135 hours in a row, which equates to almost six full days. Wow. And he did it from the comfort of his own office. So I don't know what he does for work, but yeah, he currently holds the record, 135 hours. How is he pissing? How is he, you know, is he... Just sat, you sort of, you pipe in your bag. You pipe in your bag? Yeah, I probably have some sort of system. Hmm. I mean, lands out sink in every hallway. Some other bits about like Dance Dance Revolution history and Dance Dance Revolution sort of record holders and Back stuff. to the case. So as Adam entered his adult years, he began to seclude himself from activities he had loved as a child. He stopped playing the saxophone, stopped going on hikes, stopped celebrating birthdays and holidays and became increasingly more depressed. So yeah, he wouldn't allow his mum to even put up a Christmas tree in the house. It was strictly no celebrations for yeah. any events like that. And we saw a similar thing with the Nicholas Cruz case. Once the father was kind of away from the home or off the off the scene, he, he sort of starts to assert his dominance mm. slightly. And he's a very sort of, not an intimidating figure. Slight man. Yeah, he's a very slight man. But yeah, he kind of has Nancy, I think, in, in terms of threatening to have his tantrums is what scares her the most. She doesn't yeah. want to yeah. upset him or, or, or risk any kind She's of... She's treading on eggshells the whole time. Absolutely, she? yeah. Adam then got a part-time job as a computer repair technician, as well as taking on an IT support role. He enjoyed these roles, but found it very challenging when interacting with colleagues and customers. He was also able to attend some classes at the Western Connecticut State University, but again, he found the social aspect of the environment overbearing. I was trying to think of what a cool job would be for him if he doesn't like people. I thought an IT support one would be quite good. Lighthouse. Spot on. I could see him there. Oh, that'd be scary. Mm. Yeah. State Park Ranger. Which is a good one. Mm. Yeah. Not the guy that used to do fires. All I'm thinking now is I crash land, not crash land, but in a boat. I shipwreck on a little lighthouse island and he's there. That would fucking mm. terrify me. Sorry, sorry, but it would. No, that's fine. Thanks. 
In late 2009, Adam joined the Shocked Beyond Belief Forum, which was a forum dedicated to the Columbine school shooters. And it has been speculated that he was a member of this forum for up to three years before he began to post. So yeah, he would regularly correct other people in this forum, even if it was regarding the most insignificant little detail. He would spend time thoroughly watching documentaries about school shootings, particularly Columbine, and would also spend almost all hours of his day visiting different websites and reading different articles about Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris. At this point, although we'll go on to discuss his motives later in the episode, he has almost fully secluded himself from society and became obsessed with spree killers and school shooters, uh, including their stats, weaponry and their crimes. And it's here that he slowly starts to begin to concoct his own plan. At the same time, his mother Nancy is also becoming more and more terrified of Adam as he grows into an adult. She notices that he starts talking to himself and she finds lots of graphically violent drawings in his bedroom. Like some of the other cases we've covered, he began to throw himself into an online version of himself and created his own online persona. Persona, yeah. So he called himself Cane Bread and he would play a video game which was a shooting simulator called Combat Arms. And the stats that they have on this Cane Bread that was obviously Adam Lanza is that he played over 5,000 matches on this particular game and through reports it can be evidence that Adam had killed over 83,000 496 people, claiming over 22,000 headshots. Under the same username, which I found quite interesting, so this is his video gaming name, Kane Red had also been proven to have edited 14 articles on mass murderers on Wikipedia, including the Salem Mall shooting and the Dawson Massacre, which again we mentioned before, but Anders Brevik did a very, very similar thing, and Adam, Adam Lanza very much looked up to uh, Anders Brevik. Do you think it's Kane Red because of... The rest of the game was red. I mean, it could be definitely argued that. The big red machine. I, yeah, it could be. This is the stuff that I, I wasn't as aware of in terms of his online footprint. So he would also go by the name of Smiggles on various forums online. Mm. He would make some very, very outlandish comments, but also some ramblings that other members of the forums considered paedophilic. And I didn't know this about the case. So first of all, Smiggles posted on a forum this quote, which is just so warped serial killers are lame everybody knows that mass killers are the cool kids he made other posts that other forum members considered to be that of kind of paedophilic ramblings which again i did not know this about the case so he firstly posted that he believed the age of consent should be eliminated he also posted that he had the view that adult and child sexual relationships could be beneficial to both parties and that he liked the harry potter books because children were taken from their parents i heard a podcast i listened to about this case that it's often speculated that people that who have asperger syndrome when they're at primary school and whatnot it's not so bad it doesn't seem it's not such a distance between them and their peers but when they go on to things like secondary school or high school that's when they really start noticing the big difference when people start you know mm -hmm. becoming in relationships and going to get very intimate with one another yeah. that's when it really divides them between them and that's when you can kind of see some people get very frustrated with situations and get very angry and resentful for the fact that maybe they can't relate to certain people and they have the opposite sex. Yeah, and um, that's it. There's no mention at this point of him dating or no. socialising with the opposite sex at all. And his his online persona that he's created, all these video games, this Combat Arms video game, the character that he created was just the polar opposite to him. It was yeah. a big, bulky guy with a black beret and mm. desert camo, big arms. Something he, like him. Just sounds like a, an army soldier. And he's also obviously using these different personas online to kind of say and post anything he wants to without fear of kind of reprimand. Yeah. So he's going on like kind of anonymous accounts and he's making some very, very bold claims here. He also created two Tumblr accounts as well that were kind of fanboy accounts for other mass killers, one of them being gay for McVeigh relating to another uh, mass shooter. And again, he would, on this Tumblr page, instead of obviously using Tumblr in the traditional way, he would have just a load of images of either corpses or emergency response teams or weapons. It was, yeah, it was really disgusting. The other one was, wasn't it queer for Kim Veer? Yes. So whilst all of this is going on and Adam's immersing himself more and more into this online persona, Elliot Roger vibes as well. Mm. Yeah. Adam's mother, Nancy, begins to travel all over the world. She spends more and more time away from the family house. And there are a few things at play here that are quite interesting. She also begins to start selling some of her prized possessions. And she is also diagnosed with multiple scoliosis and begins to experience insomnia and acute migraines. 
in the months prior to the massacre that we'll go on to talk about, she was in London, Australia, different parts of America. She was properly jet setting. And it's been argued that because of this diagnosis, she wanted to experience the world, sell her possessions and kind mm. of it almost as if it was kind of her bringing a curtain on her, her own life. And it can be speculated that Adam was aware of this. And this is why he goes on to start mm. with what he started. And, yeah, and there's also a time where she was considering moving to Washington yes, as well, which, as we know, Adam didn't like change. He didn't want to be uprooted. He was quite happy with, you know, even with his part-time jobs. And some people have speculated maybe his, he was, this was him after having a big argument with her about that. Yep. Could, could have been the final thing to push him over the edge. Definitely. And whilst his mother's away, he's obviously spending all of his time on these different video games, these different forums. He's researching mass killers in more intricate detail than I could even comprehend. And dancing. it's dancing. Yeah, he's dancing quite a bit, actually. He's basically decided to, and again, this is why there's so much kind of conspiracy and controversy around it. He's basically put his own plan in place of wanting to be able to pull off the perfect school shooting and it's here that we move into the timeline of the sandy hook massacre so as this timeline takes place on the 14th of december 2012 we're going to be running through the timeline with the hours of the day that certain events took place 9 a.m adam lanza wakes up and gets ready for the day he puts on all black clothing a hat and sunglasses and is sure to grab his yellow earplugs adam then proceeds to destroy his computer's hard drive adam walks into his mother's bedroom he steps careful not to wake her. She is sleeping on her back. When he reaches the top of her bed, he places a 22 caliber rifle gun next to her head, he proceeds to fire four shots into her head. Her face is left unrecognizable. After shooting his mother to death, Adam puts four guns registered legally under his mother's name into the trunk of her black Honda. He then gets in the car and drives five miles away to his old school, Sandy Hook Elementary School. A delivery driver would show up to the house between 9.30 and 10.30. It appears as though nobody's home. Whilst Adam is shooting his mother, Sandy Hook Elementary School had its doors open, welcoming children for a fun day at school. Principal Dawn Hotsprung is congratulating the fourth graders who had made their school proud with their winter concert the night before. So that straight away puts an end to the conspirators that are saying it was a, a kind of a mercy killing for his mother, because obviously he was aware of her ailments, but four times at point blank in yeah. the face to the point that half her face is now gone. Absolutely brutal. As well, I mean, this time of year, obviously so close to Christmas, on this particular day, one of the classes were actually going to have the parents coming into the school and making gingerbread houses with them. Mm -hmm. Like, listening to all the kind of things they had planned for that day, it was such a Christmassy, like, innocent scene. Bringing gifts in for their favourite teachers and... Which, you know, it just makes it, it just, yeah, it, it's... Just, for them not to know what was to happen that day, it just makes it even more heartbreaking. 9.30am. Class begins at Sandy Hook Elementary School. The children have just recited the Pledge of Allegiance. The day has just begun, but eager children are in their classrooms waiting for school to finish. It is the last day of term before Christmas break. Today's itinerary features gingerbread houses, Christmas films, Christmas songs, and most of all, lots of fun. The doors at the entrance of the school have now been locked. 9.34 a.m. Minutes after being locked, staff at the front of the building can hear unusual noises coming from the entrance of the school. It sounds to many like popping. Barbara Halstead, the school's secretary, is sitting in her office opposite the infirmary. It is here that she spots a dark figure slowly approaching the school grounds. Inside the infirmary is nurse Sally Cox. Barbara begins to warn Sally of the sounds of shooting by calling her name, and immediately the pair seek shelter under the table and can only wait. Like most schools in America, Sandy Hook had a very kind of complex security entrance to the building. However, part of the, uh, the security entrance was formed by glass, and unfortunately, that glass was not bulletproof. And after gaining entry to the school by shooting out the glass windows of the door, Adam Lanza lets himself in carrying a Bushmaster AR-15 assault rifle, a 10 mm Glock, a 9 mm Sig Sawyer, as well as hundreds of rounds of ammunition and multiple magazines. He walks into Barbara's office and he does not see her. He then makes his way in the direction of Nurse Sally and luckily, he didn't see her either. The sounds of the shooting have been projected across the school by Barbara as she accidentally switched on the school's public address system in the process of trying to silence a call that she was receiving. She answered her call and the whole school listen as she tells the school's reading specialist, there's someone in the building shooting. Get in lockdown. Imagine hearing that. Mm. It's worth noting this school, um, Sandy Hook, was for children aged 5 to 11. So 9.35 a.m., praying that it is safe, Barbara carefully crawls into Nurse Sally's office. This is when the first 911 call is made. She was begging the police to come. We'll play this for you now. I'm not 
What's the location of the emergency? Sandy Hook School. I think there's somebody shooting in here. Sandy Hook School. Okay, what makes you think that? Because somebody's got a gun. I saw a glimpse of somebody. They're running down the hallway. It sounds like there are gunshots in the hallway. I'm a teacher in the school. Okay, where are you? are you in the school right now? I am in the school. I'm in the classroom. Okay, do you have everyone in the classroom and the door? All of my students. The door is not locked yet. Locked. I have to go. Okay, I have lock to go the lock the door. door. Tell me, keep everybody calm. Keep everybody down. Get everybody away from the windows, okay? Yes. Okay. Right. Principal Dawn Hotsprung and the school psychologist Mary Sherlock are in a parent-teacher conference near the front of the building with a teacher named Natalie Hammond and a parent. All in the room hear the sounds, and so the three teachers decide to investigate and are quickly met by the gunman. When realising what has happened, Dawn Hotsprung shouts for the other members to stay where they are. Mary and Dawn try to reason with Adam, but he does not listen. Instead, he shoots both women and they are killed instantly. The third teacher is shot multiple times. She plays dead and Adam falls for it. Once he left, she manages to carry herself back to the conference room, where she and the parent wait anxiously for a saviour. Deborah Pisani was hit in the foot by a bullet after Adam walked down the hall and shot the kindergarten support teacher. Adam fired multiple shots at her, but only one landed. She silenced her scream and seeks shelter in a classroom. Adam did not attempt to finish what he had started. Children and teachers are flooded with fear. One child commented how, We thought that something fell, then we heard another, and then we thought that it was a gunshot. Another child named Daniel commented that because the speaker was on, we heard every single bullet. We heard people crying. We heard actually the people's deaths themselves. A total of 154 shots could be heard throughout the 10 minute ordeal. And for a kid to have to recall that and claiming that he heard people, the end of people's lives is mm. just, yeah. Like we said at the start of the episode, this one is um, particularly challenging. The teachers immediately begin following the school's lockdown procedure. Staff begin hiding children in any way possible. They are told to go into cubbies, toilets, under desks, and anywhere that shields them. They are told that they must remain as quiet as possible. And obviously they practice this, don't they? They have mm. all these different measures in place and training in place and it's it saves so many lives but it's like why should they even have to yeah. have to prepare for things like this one teacher resorted to singing songs very quietly in order to calm their pupils whilst others read their children books to ease their minds one child told a news reporter how her teacher read us the nutcracker and another book that was all about christmas one teacher named Caitlin Roy de Bellis placed all of her children inside a 3 by 4 feet bathroom she told news reporters that if they started crying, I'd take their face and say it's going to be okay. Show me your smile. She also reassured her children, telling them, there are bad guys out there right now. We need to wait for the good guys. She tried to calm her children down and told them all that she loved them in case it was the last word that they would hear. So yeah, that was a 15, I think 15 children she fit in there as, along with her in a space that small. She had to kind of get them to come in and out twice to kind of get them to fit properly in there. But she was very calm and yeah, she was uh, she, she was interviewed soon after. We will play a bit of it now. I, I'm the first classroom. Why isn't he coming? You know, I'm thinking we're next. And, you know, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, as as a six year old, seven year old, what are you what are your thoughts? What are your you know, and I'm, I'm thinking that I have to to almost be their parent. Like I have to tell them, you know, so I said to them, I said, I need you to know that I love you all very much and that it's going to be okay because I thought that was the last thing they were ever going to hear. Yeah, we'll, we'll go in, there's more details we, we'll go into about that particular class, um, but it's just astounding that she, you know, she was so calm and able to, you know, be calm for the children and keep them in, you know, keep them as safe as she could. And not only in that environment that they're in, but everything's being relayed to them by that tannoy. Mm. You can't imagine it, can you? No. At 9.36 a.m., a radio dispatcher call is made. It hears 6-7 Sandy Hook School. Caller is indicating she thinks there's someone shooting in the building. More teachers are calling 911 throughout this time. Adam makes his way back down the hallways of the school, continuing to fire shots down the empty corridor. The smell of gunshots and bullet holes permeates the walls that once housed children's artwork. When he reached the end of the corridor, he decides to make a left turn, which leads him to the youngest children at the school. It is important to note that the doors could only be locked from the outside, and therefore Lanza could have easily opened the doors if he so wished. It has been theorised that the only reason Adam did not attack Caitlin Rog de Bellis's classroom was that he could not see in because the paper covered the window in the door. The paper had not been taken down from the last lockdown drill. So yeah, there was some blue taped paper still attached to the door from the previous exercise mm -hmm. and, and for some reason, obviously that prevented Adam from entering. So Adam enters classrooms 8 and 10. It had been suggested that he entered classroom 8 first where he opened fire on Lauren Rosso. 
Lauren was a substitute teacher and had not been working at the school for very long. She had been covering for a teacher who was now on maternity leave. Lauren was hiding with the children in a corner of her first grade classroom when Adam opened the door. Lauren was shot in the face multiple times. She was not the only teacher in the classroom. Behaviour therapist Rachel Davino was also in the room. Adam would kill both of these women as well as 15 students who were hiding within the classroom. One student managed to escape the gunfire by hiding behind the door of the bathroom in the classroom. See, that one student had witnessed the whole class essentially being executed as well as the teachers. And you just think how, you know, the, this attack doesn't just, it's not just one day and then that's done. It's it's echoes it's through the rest life. of their lives and everyone and families and everything. And that person's witnessed a whole massacre go down. He then walked into classroom 10 where he, where he opened fire in Victoria Soto's class. The children were huddled at the back of the classroom attempting to seek shelter. It was too late. Adam opened the door and opened fire. He first hit Miss Soto. He then hit the behavioural therapist, Anne-Marie Murphy. She died protecting the student she was looking after, Dylan Hockley. She was found by the police covering his six-year-old body. Dylan also passed away. Children in classroom 10 were screaming and crying. Adam attempted to shoot, but his gun jammed. Jesse Lewis shouts for his classmates and friends to run before being shot. Five students died in this classroom. Eleven managed to escape the bullets of Adam Lance's gun because of Jesse's bravery. During this time, Rick Thorne, the school's custodian, is frantically running on the school, trying to ensure the safety of the children by locking classroom doors. He has been described as a hero and ignored the dispatcher's advice to seek shelter. Yeah, there's, there's um, recorded of him speaking to the police. And they're saying to him sh- to seek shelter, but he's, yeah, he's making sure they can do everything he can. And there are, there are so many heroes from this day. The numbers are absolutely staggering and the information is horrific. But there are so many heroes, and this could actually have been significantly higher volume of, of, of victims had it not been for all these um, amazing people on the day. The argument for Lanza is that his lack of empathy, because with the other school shootings we've covered, it's been sort of teenagers or high school students, mm-hmm. and it's not easier to comprehend. It's still a, a horrific act of violence. But when you're talking about people at the beginning of their lives, for them to experience something like this it's just it's really fucking hard to read definitely and even begin to comprehend the damage that this did to the whole community and their families it's it's horrific 9 38 a.m police and ambulance crews arrive at the scene just minutes after the initial 911 call was made however adam lanza had already claimed the lives of 20 children and six teachers 9 40 a.m We can only suspect that Adam heard the sirens of the police cars and ambulances arrive at the school. This signaled to him that his reign of terror must come to an end. Adam Lanza then turns the gun on himself and pulls the trigger. 27 people have now died within 10 minutes. Police enter the building and must make sure that there are no other shooters on the scene. At this point, it was unclear if Adam Lanza had acted alone, because some of the calls were suggesting there's people here, there's multiple people, there's a group of them. And also Rick Thorne, the police actually put him in cuffs because he was running, he was walking around as well, and they didn't know whether or not he was involved, but he was able to show some ID to show that he actually worked at the school as well. Yeah, and this kind of leaks into some of the conspiracies that we'll, we'll talk about afterwards, because there are, there are a lot. 9.41 a.m. Chris Manfredonia, who had a daughter at the school, was detained by police after arriving at the school as they originally suspected that he was one of the shooters. He panicked as he saw broken glass at the entrance of the school, and so he went around the side of the classroom to make sure his daughter was safe. So he turned up wearing camo trousers and a black top, so the police kind of thought that would be in fitting with someone that was part of this. 9.51 a.m. Adam Lanza's body is found in classroom 10. At 10.30 a.m., after securing the perimeter for an hour, children and teachers are escorted out of their classrooms by the police. At first, a lot of teachers did not let their children leave until the police can confirm their identity. Police were asked to unlock doors and show their badges for proof that they weren't the gunman in disguise. So this was particularly prevalent to the, the, um, the, the classroom that were in the toilet. Basically, the police were knocking on the door and she, she didn't believe them and she said, I need to see a badge. They put the badge under the door. She still didn't believe them. She said, if you were the police, you'd be able to open the door with a key. And eventually they came back and let her out. Because that's another point. Wasn't Lanza as well, although this all happened so, so quickly, he was still knocking on doors and asking them to let him in. Mm. And they would refuse. And that obviously fueled their, their paranoia for the police arriving. But he was he was getting agitated by not being able to enter certain rooms. He was trying to actively get into different rooms by asking to be let in and people were refusing him. The children are told to form a line and close their eyes. They place their hands on the person in front of them. In the words of one child, we all put our hands on other people's shoulders and then our teacher held the first person's hand and she led us out. As they walk out, police form human wall barriers over the bodies in the hallway. 
Once they are out of the school, they are walked to the nearby fire station. Anyone who could help was sent to the fire station. Nurses waited at the fire station to help those who had been injured. And once at the fire station, anxious parents can see the first set of children arrive safely. The children are placed into groups depending on their age. It is from here that parents can collect their children. So it was said that apparently there wasn't many people who were injured. They were essentially, they hadn't been touched or they'd been killed. It, it was such a horrific attack. I think there were two bullets in total that weren't fatal mm. of all that were shot, which is... 11 a.m. It is at this point that police confirm that there have been multiple fatalities. Parents of the victims are taken into a room with the governor and state police. It is here that they are told the news that will change their lives forever. Police begin to search the scene and collect evidence. They realize that the car that Adam Lanza drove to the school was registered under his mother's name. This is where his older brother, Ryan Lanza's, ID is found with an address on it. Upon finding the house the car was registered to, police make their way into the Lanza household, and when they arrive, no one answers. So Adam did have a car, but because he was so reclusive, his car battery was, had died from him not using it, essentially, it was so underused, that's why he used his mother's car. And then finding the ID, because he turned the gun on himself, the wounds that he inflicted on himself were so severe, they couldn't tell if the idea was Ryan's or, or you know, they weren't, they assumed it obviously it was Ryan. So at 11.58 a.m. approximately, it is announced that the majority of fatalities are first grade children who have been hit 3 to 11 times. Later on in the day, a makeshift morgue is made in the car park of Sandy Hook Elementary School. Each body is carried out carefully and taken to the car park. From here, they will be taken to the coroner's office. 1.30pm, Maggie Gordon, a reporter, had been assigned to the house. When Peter Lanza arrives at the house, Peter questions Maggie, asking why she was outside his ex-partner's house. Maggie delivers the news to Peter that someone within the household has committed horrific crimes that have shattered the community. Peter enters the house, he finds Nancy's body, and he makes a call to the police. You can see him kind of notably go in, he comes down looking very distraught, handing it on against his head, and then he, he makes the call to the police to report the killing of his ex-wife. Because at this point as well, he, Peter, the, the father of Adam, he hadn't seen Adam for two years. They'd been Yeah, and, and as you said, like, Nancy wasn't overly um, open about what was going on with him mm -hmm. as well. I don't know whether that was to prevent judgment from him or, or make him not worry, but yeah this was all it wasn't some of these cases like with james holmes there was more signs and there was more things that you know the parents were like oh he's seeking treatment he is thinking these things they didn't have a link to this or they mm -hmm. it's been you know believed they didn't know at the same time ryan lanza is made aware of the shooting cnn is posting that ryan was the killer he leaves his office in new york and is later texted by co-workers telling him that this office has been raided police later took ryan to a police station but not as a suspect Police questioned Ryan about his younger brother. So I think he actually tweeted out, kind of cursing the police for thinking it was him as well. 5.30 p.m. A search warrant allows the police team to search Adam Lanza's home. Once they arrive at the house, neighbours are asked to evacuate for fear of their own safety. Police enter the house and this is where they find Nancy laying in her pyjamas with four bullet wounds in her head. Upon investigation, there is evidence that Adam had directly placed the gun next to his mother's head whilst she lay sleeping. After finding Nancy's body, the police also investigate Adam Lanza's room. They find the windows had been blacked out as they had bin bags placed over them and that he had destroyed his computer's hard drive. As hard as police have worked to get information from this hard drive, nothing has ever been recovered. Which makes you think of how, what other dark things are on there. Definitely, definitely. Although nothing was found on the hard drive, Adam's computer is damning. He has downloaded and watched films that show gun violence, as well as a game named School Shooter. This horrific game allows the person playing it to participate from a first-person perspective in an active school shooting. Police also found pictures of him with a gun placed against his head and other pictures of him with guns. It is here that they also find a spreadsheet, which Tom referenced earlier in the episode, that he had been collating for years, ranking mass murderers. Police also find that in 2009, Adam Lanza had created an online profile under the name Cane Bread. He had played approximately 5,000 hours of combat arms in which he had shot 83,496 other characters. Moreover, he had also edited 14 Wikipedia pages that were all on the subject of mass murders. They also find knives, swords and guns throughout the home. And within Adam's room, police find a Christmas gift from Nancy to Adam. And the gift read, buy a gun, love mum. In this instance, it feels shocking, obviously with the context that we've just gone through. But as we said, that was just an activity that the mum thought was a thing they bonded over. A shared it, passion. Yeah, but gives you, you know, the shudders thinking about it. 
Police find more disturbing evidence. Um, no child pornography is found on its desktop, but research indicating support for it was found. Pictures of what can be assumed to be a body wrapped in plastic are discovered, as well as books and research about other shootings that had occurred. These shootings centered around inflicted attacks on children. The 15th of December, all the bodies of those who have been killed in the school shooting undergo an autopsy. All were killed by gunshot. Adam Lanter's body is removed from the school on the 15th of December. His body also undergoes an autopsy. It is found that he weighs only 112 pounds and is six feet tall. That doesn't sound very heavy. It's just below 51 kilograms. Jeez. So, because as you mentioned earlier on, an eating disorder was developed and it was said that that weight could even indicate that it could start causing brain damage as well, being that weight. Do you think that was a factor in his... Well, do you think he's... Because obviously his, his online persona, he's created this big bulky character that's destroying all of these other characters. Because the most motive of an elementary school rather than a high school there's loads of conspiracies about why he chose that and then there's also the really strange online history that he had searching mm. topics relating to children do you think also there's a, a part of him where that's because he was quite analytical he's thought about the fact that if he goes somewhere where there's anyone bigger than him i mean there are obviously adults and teachers mm. on this site but i just think because of that thing he wrote about hating sandy hook i know what you mean it makes sense and I, I think he is very like his way of thinking would be very pragmatic and not non emotional. And he, he his big thing about the list he was compiling was the higher up in the list was down to how many people you killed. And he probably yeah. thought you'd be he's more likely to kill more people going to a school, you know, with people who are a lot younger and, and more vulnerable, definitely. Because revenge isn't kind of painted into this case as much as other spree killers or mass shooters that mm. we've, we've covered like there's not he's not going back against people that he feels has wronged him it's been said with a lot of mass killings in terms of people who suffer with, with autism as well it's, it's not done for monetary gain or um, sexual desire it's done through general anger I think so, someone was saying that you couldn't go and do this unless you were like drowning in, in rage and drowning in anger yeah. and the frustrations he felt of maybe he could have had a better life if he felt like he could have been taught better or maybe he was brought mm -hmm. up in different conditions even though he, as we said he grew up in a very you know in a loving home he, he was financially supported his mum did make strides to try and get him looked after at these schools as well his dad even said before that he he, he enjoyed Sandy Hook when he was there Yeah. so it's it's very confusing as to why and it's one of those things I think we will never know the actual, actual yeah. reason why it could also just be that complete lack of empathy that they said was yeah. a trait in him from a really early age so on the 16th of December the scale of the loss seen at Sandy Hook Elementary School affects everyone in America this is the second deadliest shooting in the country President Obama went on to make a very poignant speech on the 16th of December which we'll play for you now our unalienable right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness those rights were stripped from college kids in Blacksburg, in Santa Barbara, and from high schoolers at Columbine, and, and from first graders in Newtown. First graders. And from every family who who never imagined that their loved one would be taken from our lives by a bullet from a gun. Every time I think about those kids, it gets me mad. And by the way, it happens on the streets of Chicago every day. So, all of us need to demand a Congress brave enough to stand up to the gun lobby's lies. All of us need to stand up and protect its citizens. All of us need to demand governors and legislators and businesses do their part to make our communities safer. After hearing that speech, I think you can obviously see he was very moved and very emotional. I think if you were watching that at the time, you would have thought maybe this is when action is going to be made this is when there's going to be change how can you just sit by and be like okay let's just stick to how things are after that you think yeah. okay but then hearing it now with so many years gone past and as you mentioned so many shootings still were occurring you just think it's never going to change because if that if that kind of attack hasn't shifted people's opinions or they can't understand as to why 
it's so dangerous and such and the law is so skewed and it's it doesn't make sense it ha that if that isn't going to change your mind then what is like it yeah so one week after the shooting a police have finally taken thousands of photos and concluded gathering evidence from the scene roughly three weeks later rumors begin to circulate that the school shooting was a hoax people begin to theorize that the whole thing was staged to ban guns three weeks after the shooting a person called the fire department telling them that the shooting never happened online comments begin to take toll on the victims families Messages such as, as fake as it gets, and fucking lies, are written under the posts about the tragedy. People begin to terrorise those who have been affected. Families of those who had lost their children and loved ones begin receiving calls from those who thought it was a hoax. They would be taunted down the phone and told they would receive the same death that had been inflicted upon their supposedly murdered children. Some would even go as far as to say they were Adam Lanza. Fucking mental. Imagine, yeah, you've had your child killed, and then people go, you're lying, and then they're threatening you and then they're taunting you by pretending to be Adam Lanza. It's been widely reported very recently. Theorists such as Alex Jones believe the families affected by the shooting were crisis actors. Supposedly they went into witness protection to protect their identities. So Alex Jones was taken to court and was forced to pay four million dollars in reprimands for defamation and this has since risen to 1.5 billion. He has since admitted that he now believes his handy hook was a real event. Just oh. The same happened with the Parkland, the mm -hmm. Nicholas Cruz shooting. They all again were accused of being crisis actors it's i i don't understand the argument in terms of so yes if you're a gun enthusiast and you want to remain the right to carry arms there's ways to go about voicing that uh opinion or belief literally taunting people that have lost their babies yeah. and becoming a bit of a keyboard warrior you know an internet troll on sympathetic posts or posts that are in memorial alex jones speaking to his millions of followers and listeners passionately saying how it's all fake i mean it's what is he baffling. gaining from that apart from clout or supposed clout mm. I don't understand the benefit one year later exactly a vigil is held for the children that lost their lives at the hands of Adam Lanza Jessica Ricos aged six Olivia Engel aged six Catherine Hubbard aged six Charlotte Bacon aged six Daniel Barden aged seven Aviel Richmond aged six Josephine Gay aged seven Anna Marquez Green aged six, Jesse Lewis, aged six, Dylan Hockley, aged six, Madeline Hassou, aged six, Grace Audrey McDonnell, aged seven, Chase Kowalski, aged seven, James Mattiolo, aged six, Emily Parker, aged six, Jack Pinto, aged six. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. Noah Ponza, age six. Caroline Providi, age six. Benjamin Wheeler, age six. Alison Wyatt, age six. Victoria Soto, age 27. Lauren Rossu, age 30. Dawn Hutchsprung, age 47. Mary Shellach, age 56. Rachel Devino, age 26. Anne Marie Murphy, age 52. So, yeah, it's, it's staggering when that many people in that eight there's very very young ages um taken from one person's senseless acts so now we're going to go into the aftermath of this um a tragic event um president obama took the initial stages to make tighter gun control laws he attempted to pass two new laws which would have made it compulsory for there to be background checks done on those wishing to purchase a gun and he wanted to make there be a limited number of bullets a gun could fire at one time which seems perfectly reasonable however none of these laws were passed by congress which I mean, there's a, that advert, isn't there, about the uh, rights to carry arms was when you had it took you about 20 seconds to reload a bullet after a mm -hmm. bullet. What's the need for having automatic rifles for people who just, you know, just doing it for a hobby? It doesn't, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. One of the images that really just stood out to me and I put it at the start of our notes was just a, literally a placard that was placed by one of the memorial sites and it just literally said, why? Yeah. And it just really hits you. With any of the, the spree killers or the school shooters that we read out and there's a huge list of victims, it just, it, it the ages and the amount and the volume is just, it's, it's hard to comprehend the amount of damage that this did and the fact then that there's as you said there's no change just doesn't make sense i can't make it make sense 
The National Rifle Society helped in stopping the successful passing of these laws. In their opinion, placing restrictions on the sales of guns is a step closer to fully eradicating them, something they do not want. Janet Zimmerman, a pistol instructor, said that you shoot to stop the threat. Diane Rice, a psychologist and gun owner, added on this, commenting that when someone gets in a car accident, it's not normal to blame the car. When someone was drinking and driving, we don't blame the car or the alcohol. We look at what's happening with the person and I think, um, firearms are a tool. Diane also raises an interesting point stating that these mass killings really began to occur within the last couple of decades. So the guns have been there the whole time. What's changed is something within our society. You can understand that point to an extent, but at the same time as cars aren't being used as a weapon as such to purely be taken out and driven into people, whereas guns are literally there to harm. I think it's the access of them as well that just seems to be they almost given them away, which again, I just can't make it make sense. Although there was not a nationwide law which restricted the regulations upon guns, 21 states in America did decide to tighten their gun control laws. We can all agree that if we look at what's happening with the person, then mental health services do need to be upgraded in order to prevent such tragedies like this one from occurring again. Because again, a look at his internet history, someone checking in and asking what you know what's going on in his life i guess the the right of privacy i don't think you can be able to delve into those things i mean a, a, a background check it seems the least thing you could mm-hmm. do the victims families have also agreed with this and since the shooting the victims families have tried to shed a bit of light on such a horrific event the sandy hook promise has been set up as a non-profit organization their aim is to improve mental well-being and reform gun control laws in addition to this the government did place an extra 100 million dollars into mental health facilities for young people on the um, sandy hook promise website um sandyhookpromise.org they actually have a thing on there know the signs you can prevent gun violence and other harmful acts where they basically have 10 critical warning signs of violence which I'm going to run through now because it's, it's quite interesting to see so number one is suddenly withdrawn from friends family and activities including online or via social media number two bullying especially if targeted towards difference in race religion gender or sexual orientation number three excessive irritability lack of patience or becoming angry quickly number four experiencing chronic loneliness or social isolation Number five, expressing persistent thoughts of harming themselves or someone else. Number six, making direct threats towards a place, another person or themselves. Number seven, bragging about access to guns or weapons. Number eight, recruiting accomplices or audiences for an attack. Number nine, directly expressing a threat as a plan. Number 10, cruelty to animals. Fair few of those are ticked off by Lanza. Yeah, on their website as well. They've got an anti-gun advert, which is, yeah, we'll, we'll play a little bit of it. it it's, it's basically a kind of going back to school advert of kids who you know they've got a new skateboard and then the kids say i've got this new skateboard and he's breaking a window to escape the shooter oh god they've got this got a new phone it's really good to contact to stay in touch with my mum, and she's texting the mum saying i love you when the shoot it's like it's really jarring and cleverly how they've done it but it just shows that it really puts you in the yeah it's it's a really it's a hard watch but it's a very clever advert and a very impactful advert so we'll play a bit of it now but i recommend searching it because yeah it's it's worth worth seeing this year, my mom got me the perfect bag for back to school. These new sneakers are just what I need for the new year. This jacket is a real must-have. My parents got me the skateboard I wanted. It's pretty cool. And I finally got my own phone to stay in touch with my mom. One thing we didn't mention in the the timeline and the childhood is a reference to the call that uh, Adam Lanza once made to the Anarchy radio show. And basically he calls in, it's a late night radio show, and Lanza calls in to discuss the topic, which we've actually covered before, of Travis the Chimp. So basically what it showed is Adam called into this uh, Anarchy radio show in the months leading up to the massacre, and it gave a really interesting insight into his mental state because he's communicating sort of at them 
Mm. They're listening to him, and he's very educated in the way he, he the, the words he chooses to use in this tonality. But he's very kind of uh, it's very eerie in hindsight. But he's basically arguing sort of there's no there's very little difference between what Travis did to what a serial killer would mm. do. So we'll play a bit of that for you now as well. The attack can be seen entirely parallel to the attacks, random acts of violence that you bring up on your show every week, mm. committed by humans, which the mainstream also has no explanation for. And no actual human I just, just don't think it would be such a stretch to say that he very well could have been a teenage mall shooter or something like that the Sandy Graham project was created in collaboration with the Where Angels Play Foundation this is a beautiful project and for each of the 26 lives lost 26 playgrounds were built in three states so that those living in chaos and destruction created by Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy could have a place to play and forget their surroundings for a few hours the playgrounds were constructed with a vision of the loved one that was lost it would consist of their favourite colours their favourite animal and superheroes used to remember with the lives lost. A lot of the family members of the survivors, as well as the father of Adam Lanza, have, have gone on to write books about the events uh, and memoirs. A lawsuit was filed against Remington Arms, the gun manufacturer company. Nine of the victims' families took the company to court in the hopes of preventing another Sandy Hook. The company would later settle to pay $73 million to the families in 2022. This was a huge court case and was the first time that a gun company was made liable for a school shooting. The previous year, the company had offered 33 million to settle the case but all families declined this sum josh koskov the leading attorney for the families commented that for the gun industry it's time to stop recklessly marketing all guns to all people for all uses and instead ask how marketing can lower the risk rather than court it remington arms is now in bankruptcy Yes, so as you said, a very heavy case this week. Um, I mean, they're all heavy, but this one felt particularly heavy to cover. That was the case of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. We're not going to do look alike as this week. It just doesn't feel right to do it. Apologies if anyone particularly wanted to see some terrible shouts from us. Also, I want to say a big quick thank you to Gully Garland for dressing us this series. As we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we do have a new website now, which is the new home of um, ICMAP, www.icmap.co.uk, icmap.co.uk, mm. where we have all our Minnesotas now. We'll be living over there. All the new ones will be going up over there. And we also have exclusive merch over there. So be sure to check that out. Yeah, and if you just can't wait until next week's episode, why not give us a follow on all of the socials, at Could Murder a Pod, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We haven't got a LinkedIn, um, TikTok. Uh, Reddit. Reddit, yeah. We've got a subreddit, we which is us. popping off. And we also wanted to say a huge thank you because we also received some very interesting photos of, of your boys, Swampy and Scully. Although we aren't doing looky-likeys this week, we have got some photos from the brilliant Stephen Henderson, mm-hmm. who kind of has uh, brought Swampy and Scully to life in the most interesting of ways. Uh, so we'll pop these photos up now. Obviously, terrific job with Scully, looking strong. And Swampy's, you know, he's still going. He's still there. He's still going. He's, yeah. he's all right. He's all right. He's all right. Yeah. Quite the thrill to see those pictures. Thank you very much for that. Any artwork, always very much appreciated. Always interested Absolutely. to see what you guys can come up with a very creative audience so we love to see it so yes guys thank you once again for watching if you are listening to us on itunes or spotify or wherever you listen to us leave us a little review on there it does help get the word out there and also if you're watching us on youtube why not hit the notification bell and give us a sub the dream is one day for us to hit the hundred thousand and get a little plaque oh cool that would be the dream That's but cool. um you know we're plugging away for that one day yeah. um and yeah all the support from you guys we very much appreciate and all the kind words it doesn't go unnoticed so thank you very much so we will be back next week with another big big case making our way through the series thank you all so much for the lovely feedback and uh yeah we look forward to seeing you next time icmap.co.uk check it out it's really simple as well easy lots, to remember lots of lovely merch you can get yourself a little little mug and like as we said there's lots of new garments which we were promising for about 78 years and they are actually here now so super quick delivery as well super like quick. suspiciously quick it's quite it's <laughs> yeah mugs are really quick but i wouldn't say yeah. about the other ones because okay it takes two Sus- weeks the mugs arrive suspiciously quick <laughs> they did it was if they crawled from the swamp yeah crawl from the swamp right Hello. to your door anyway guys like we always say we say this all the time Keep doing what you're doing. Oh, don't don't spend a whole week on Dance Dance Arcadium. Uh, Arca- dance Dance Arcadium. Arcadium sounds quite cool. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll make it. Anyway, see that guys. See ya. Two pip. She travelled all over the world. <laughs> <That's> so loud. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just wanted to see what was underneath it. <laughs>